Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. This is the first of what may be many of these virtual seminars that we are doing on behalf of the National Beagle Club. Gotta love technology. Um, you know, we're able to, to have people, as we were talking, from, you know, four different time zones, all sorts of different places. Um, as you know, we are recording this, so that way people who were not able to participate live will be able to watch this. This is the seminar that we had planned to give at the National. Um, Dr. Kessler very graciously said that he would give it at the National. And then we had too many entered. Not, not too many entered. I shouldn't say it that way. We had a very large entry and we ran out of hours in the day. Um, and so uh, I talked with Mindy and we brainstormed about this and decided this would be great to be able to offer this online because now we can get people who weren't even at the national. Um, and so this is a fabulous way to do this. I would like to introduce my co-host and the sponsor of our event today. And that is Mindy Levin. Mindy is with Royal Canaan. And so, you know, thank you so much to Royal Canaan for sponsoring, you know, several things at the national and, um, and of course, sponsoring the, the seminar today. So Mindy, if you would like to introduce Dr. Kessler, we will just go from there. I would love to, and thank you so much for having us. We're, we're thrilled to be here with you this evening. Um, my name is Mindy Levin. I'm the National All Breed Events Manager with Royal Canaan, and I will at, at some point in the chat post my contact information should anyone want to reach me afterward. Um, and I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Rick Kessler. Um, Dr. Kessler is a Senior Scientific Services Veterinarian with Royal Canaan. He graduated from Iowa State University he was meant to be in um, uh, reproduction medicine because he actually um, was born into a family where his mother uh, bred German shepherds. So he's been doing this all his life. Um, we're very fortunate to have him at Royal Canaan and he has written articles and, and given lectures on various topics around reproduction. So with that, I would love to turn it over to Dr. Kessler. I will say if you think of any questions along the way, we will leave time at the end. Please put those in the chat um, along the way and we'll moderate for Dr. Kessler or we can open up um, at the end. I do want to have one other request. If you could mute your mic during the presentation, that would be awesome. Um, and we'll have you on mute later if you have a question. But uh, with that, I will stop talking and turn can, it over to can Dr. You explain, can you explain how to mute? Uh, yes, in the upper right or right-ish corner, you should, as you, if you hover your um, cursor around, you should see the word mute come up. So, so Claudia, it's, it's not in the upper the right corner left. of your picture. There will be three little dots and that's where you want to, to click where it says, uh, if you hover over the, the top right corner of your picture, you would see mute. And if you can't, it, I'm not, oh, she got it. So cool. Okay. E either mute or, or try to keep the, the, the volume down at your home. That's all. <laughs> All right, with that, I will stop chatting and I will turn it over to Dr. Rick Kessler. So mute is in the upper left-hand corner of my screen. So not to, not to change anything, but that's where it is. So um, this is the first time that Mindy has introduced me without um, insinuating that I'm an old man. Um, so I appreciate that, Mindy. Um, I don't know why you did chose tonight uh, with the Beagles to do that, but... Uh, that is very, very nice. So that said, um, I appreciate you all being here. This is a, of all the topics that I talk about. And as Mindy could tell you, I talk a lot about topics. Uh, this is my favorite topic because who doesn't want to save and understand uh, neonates um, because you're breeders. So uh, in my view, um, that is the most important thing that we want to do. Um, so we're going to talk about neonatology. I've been dealing with neonatology um, probably for 38 years. Um, and the reason being is that um, one of my clients way back when was a human neonatologist who um, basically said that I was a Neanderthal when it came to uh, uh, puppies. And, and I probably was, or I, I was, and uh, he has helped me throughout my career advance neonatology for breeders. Um, and to me, it's a, an important topic. So neonates to me neonates are different. To me, uh, uh, so I'm getting feedback, Mindy. Um, I don't know if you are, but I'm getting feedback. So I don't know how we change that. It's Usually sounding good to me. Somebody is not muted. Okay. Um, 
Let me see. Let me look through because I can manually mute people. Yeah, if you would, because it's it's kind of uh, a little distracting, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. So neonatology to me is the first three weeks of life. Um, and, you know, we call them puppies, but they're not really puppies until um, they get through the neonate uh, stage. And so tonight we're going to basically talk about neonatology and how we can basically not only look and save these neonates, but basically what we can do to enhance their life some. And uh, so that is important to me and, and I'm sure it's important to you. Um, as far as questions go, um, if you have a question while I'm talking that applies to what I'm talking about, then just put it in the chat. And then we can, um, I don't know if Mindy or Deb wants to deal with it, but basically we can deal with those questions right then and there, or else we can do it as we uh, get through the whole program. Um, I have shortened this up because I'm a talker, as Mindy would say, and, and I want to have time for you all to ask questions. So um, the first slide here is basically um, two items. Basically, we have milk on the right side. Um, and we have colostrum on the left. And as you know, colostrum is, is very important for um, our neonates. Basically, it provides immunoglobulins. All, you're all familiar with that. But basically, it, it, it also provides um, growth enhancements, growth hormones, um, and also obviously uh, allows these neonates to advance into puppyhood. So tonight we'll talk a little bit and start with the colostrum and what you as breeders can do to um, improve your colostrum in your puppies because um, in your neonates, because basically colostrum is only there for a short period of time. Um, and most of you or all of you probably have no idea if the colostrum is, if there's quantity or quality. So we can't just look at the bitch and say, well, she's bagged up and she has quality and quantity of colostrum. We have no ability to do that. So um, there are ways um, that I don't go backwards. Um, okay. I'll get this straightened out. Maybe. Just keeps going the same way. So can we make it healthier? Um, yes, we certainly can. There's things we can do. Um, here are some of the things that play a role in, in the health and the, and the quality of our colostrum. There's vaccines. We'll talk about that. There are fat, there's carbohydrates, there's digestible proteins versus just proteins you find in your food. Um, there's water that we need to talk about because water is very important, not only for colostrum, but also basically for our neonates. Um, there's body condition score. Um, and then there's pain that we need to consider um, for the health and for the, the quality of our. So let's start with vaccines. Um, as you know, there are immunoglobulins in our colostrum. Um, and what we want to do is enhance those in immunoglobulins to our advantage and also to our neonate uh, uh, advantage. And so if we go through the diseases that you as breeders are, are concerned about for neonates and puppies, uh, usually the number one uh, problem that we want to consider is parvo. Still today um, at this time and in, in date that parvo is the number one disease that is dreaded by um, uh, breeders. And so there is a way that we can actually enhance um, the parvo immunoglobulins in our um, in, in our colostrum. And the way that we do that is to use a univalent. In other words, we're just using a parvo vaccine, not a five-way or a three-way. Um, and we do this about six weeks, 42 days before she comes into heat. So we can actually improve um, the parvo immunoglobulins that are found in, in colostrum if we vaccinate her six weeks right before um, she comes into heat. Now you may say, well, I don't know when she's coming to heat or she's variable, um, but it's if you can get a vaccine into her anywhere between six to eight weeks, then basically we are going to uh, increase the amount of immunoglobulins in that colostrum, which goes a long way um, for the protection um, once they get into puppyhood, because the window of opportunity for parvo is anywhere from six weeks of age to 20 weeks of age. That's when we see the majority of cases and the way that we can um, lessen that uh, 
proneness to parvo is basically to vaccinate her again with a univalent. In other words, just a parvo vaccine um, six weeks before she comes into heat. So the second thing we can do um, is to improve um, what we consider um, the energy that these pup or the new unites are going to use to grow. So fat and carbs are basically the most important um, when it comes to not only uh, the puppy growth during the last trimester, but also basically the, the amount of energy that's found in those in that colostrum and then follow up with that milk. So you want to be in the last trimester feeding her a diet that has around 21% fat. Um, and carbs are around 30% protein. Um, and that is, again, um, that's the, the energy that puppies grow from is fat and carbohydrates. Um, you, you all are familiar in milk having lactose and lactose is a carbohydrate and lactose is a great energy source for our neonates. And then um, once they get through that neonate uh, period, then they go into puppyhood. Digestible proteins are obviously important, um, but we don't need to be a high protein diet. What we want is digestible. And what we mean by digestible proteins is um, a diet that is over 90% digestible. Most diets on the market today are in the 75 to 85% digestibility. So we want um, to pay for that extra uh, digestibility because that's everything. And then water. Water is, is critical for our neonates. Water is critical for the bitch. Water is critical for uh, producing milk and colostrum. Our, our puppies or neonates are, are born 82% water. Um, so basically, I try to, to tend to think of them as water bags. Um, and we need to make sure that um, your bitches are drinking enough water to uh, produce that. And as you know, whether you have a C-section or they have a normal birth, they are losing a fair amount of water and we need to prepare them um, for that loss so they don't become clinically dehydrated. Um, so one way that we know um, how much the minimal amount of water your bitches should be drinking is to understand that how much energy you're feeding her on a day-to-day -day basis. And energy is measured in kilo calories per kilogram, and that's on the bag of your foods. So if you know how many kilocalories that you're feeding your bitch, then basically one milliliter of water um, is the minimal amount of uh, fluid that she should be getting on a day-to-day -day basis. Now notice I said that that's the minimal amount. Um, we certainly want to, her to be drinking more water than the minimum amount. And so there are, way, there are ways that we can increase that. Nope. Getting more feedback. Okay. Uh, please, everybody, make sure that you have muted. Dina, I think it might be you. You might need to mute. It's not letting me manually mute. So please, everyone, make sure that you have muted yourselves. Yeah, it's hard enough for me to think much less to listen to somebody else while I'm trying to. So basically, water is is, is critical for our, for our bitch. And if we know how many kilocalories on a day-to-day -day basis she's getting, then the minimal amount of water that she needs is, is one milliliter for each kilocalorie. And the way that we want to use that water consumption um, is we can bait the water and we bait the water using um, a lot of different products. You know, in, in Royal Canaan, we use the moose. Um, and if you're not familiar with moose, then Mindy can help you with that. But there's other ways that we can enhance water intake in our in our bitch. So body condition score. Um, I bring this up because body condition score um, is a, is a way to measure not only the health of our bitch, but basically um, how healthy she is in her uterus and how healthy she is in life. And so if she's in an upper body condition score, and what I mean by that. If she's over four and a half, then basically she's in an inflammatory state. And that's the last thing we want uh, our bitches to be is in an inflammatory state 
during pregnancy or basically while she's lactating. Um, lactation is the most energy demanding time of her life. Um, and basically we need to make sure she's in an excellent body condition score. So I bring up pain um, and pain is really critical for um, our bitches um, not to be in pain. So if you, again, you all know um, that basically birthing is a painful process in most cases, or probably all cases. Um, and pain basically uh, constricts blood vessels in our bitch. So we want to make sure that if we've had a long, prolonged, um, painful delivery, um, or if you've had a C-section, then we want to use a couple days of pain medication because that will allow those vessels to dilate and her basically to allow that uh, colostrum to come down um, and be available to our puppies. Um, and so pain in today's world is still overlooked in, in reproduction. And I'm hoping that uh, um, you understand that it shouldn't be. Um, pain goes a long way in allowing um, the quality and quantity of our colostrum to be there. So this is a fetal growth rate, and this is a, I put beagles there, but you could put any breed of dogs there. So it's really important to understand if you look at, if you go across that, that graph and you look at day 42, um, that only about 10 to 15% of body weight in our neonates or our puppies in utero during the last trimester or in the first two trimesters. Um, there's only about 15% of their body weight. The, the amount of body weight uh, actually goes up amazing in that last trimester. So that's what we consider when we're feeding our bitch. We're not worried about energy consumption during the first two trimesters. We're worried about that energy consumption during the last trimester because that's where about 80, 85% of that growth comes from in puppies. Um, so what can we do about that? Well, basically, we're going to feed a higher energy dense diet during the last trimester. Um, and the reason for that, obviously, is um, we need to basically support her growth and her body condition score. We need basically to support that 85 percent of growth. But the other thing that we really need to consider during that last trimester is now she's basically um, making that colostrum. Um, and getting ready to drop that. And, and so that's where the fat and carbohydrates play a huge role um, for those three processes going on. Um, and again, if you went back to that one slide that I put on fat and carbohydrates, that is critical. Carbohydrates allow 50% of that growth in that last trimester. So never overlook the fact that whatever you're feeding your, your bitch during the last trimester, that she needs carbohydrates above 30%. She needs fat about 21%. Um, and protein, while it's important, um, it is, is not the most critical um, macronutrient that we're thinking about. Um, and so those three macronutrients are really important in the last trimester. During the first two trimesters, micronutrients are more important, not macronutrients. And so we're not looking at kilocalories on, on the bag. We're looking at micronutrients that's basically enhance the reproductive performance during the first two trimesters. Um, if you think about that and you go back and we don't have day 21, um, or the last of the first trimester on this slide, but yeah, you can obviously see there isn't much going on in the way of weight gain. Basically, she doesn't even, um, those cells don't even implant in her uterus until day 21 or day 22. They're basically just rolling around in that uterus looking for a place to implant. So earlier, Deb, I heard say that she had a, uh, somebody had a, a bitch that basically had 11 puppies. Um, that's, that's a healthy, um, uterus. And so as we, we progress during the last trimester, those cells are basically starting, um, to divide. Um, but again, not a lot of, uh, weight is being gained. Um, and so the second trimester is basically the time where folic acid plays a huge role and vitamin A plays a huge role. Um, they play a role in cell division. You know, when we talk about folic acid, most breeders think about um, cleft palates, and, and that's something to think about. But most cleft palates 
in today's world are genetic. Um, but basically cell division is critical. And that's when those cells are um, dividing and thinking about what they're going to be um, during that last trimester. And what do I mean by that? Are they going to be bone? Are they going to be a part of the nervous system? The eyes, brains, are they going to be bone? Um, all kinds of things going on there. And that's during that second trimester. During the third trimester, all that is basically taken care of. And now we're putting that weight and growth on. So again, never overlooking the fact that weight, I mean, fat and carbs are really critical during this period of time. And we want to stay within the realm of what we need during this time. Too much fat, too much carbohydrates, not enough carbohydrates, not enough fat um, will go a long way in making our neonates healthy. Um, so we want to make sure we stay within the realm of around 21% fat and 30% carbohydrates. So to me, this is one of the most important slides that um, you all can basically be looking at and understanding. And this is basically how we feed our, our, um, our puppies. So Mindy mentioned that my mother was a breeder. Um, in today's world, I want the bitch to come in to heat at around four and a half. I want her to be at four and a half, maybe five um, during the last end of last trimester. And then when she goes through weaning, I want her to be four and a half. We had no ability when I was a young child um, and helped my mother with the uh, German shepherds to be able to feed her like that. Um, we basically had no clue how to feed our dogs during the 50s. Um, and basically um, our bitch, no matter what we fed her and no, how much we fed her, um, by the time she went, they went through weaning, um, she was basically that typical rack of bones. And in today's world, there's no excuse for that because we know how to feed her during the different stages of pregnancy. So this is just a cute picture of not beagles. Um, as you can tell, hopefully you're all beagle people so you know they're not beagles. Um, but the, the question I'm saying is it's very difficult not at this age, but in neonates um, to tell if they're healthy or not. Um, they're very difficult to examine um, because they're not really puppies. They're a bag of water, like I said, their livers are not working properly, their kidneys are not working properly, their brains are not working properly, their muscles are not working properly. Um, not much on them is working properly during the first three, um, especially the first week of life. But what is working is basically they can smell um, and they can taste. And without that sense of uh, smell or taste, then basically they would not survive because that's the only thing they have is to survive. They can't obviously um, monitor their own blood pressure, I mean, uh, temperature. Um, and that is critical for their survival also. So. So the first thing we want to talk about is, is the weight during the, uh, it's really critical to get a, a birth weight um, after we've dried them. And then we certainly want to weigh them four hours later and eight hours later, because one of the main components of knowing if one puppy or two is um, becoming critical is, is uh, a significant loss of weight. You know, it isn't unusual for them to lose 5% or 10% of their weight during the first four hours. And that's just basically because the when they're born wet, they're basically starting to dehydrate that way. And that's okay. But after four hours, then that, that weight loss should turn around because, and this is really important when it comes to colostrum, is that we want them to get colostrum within the first four hours of life. Um, that is when colostrum is at the uh, highest quality. Um, and that is also when the colostrum is the highest quantity. They certainly can absorb colostrum after four hours, but that, co that quality is starting to go downhill quickly. Um, and they can absorb colostrum up to 24 hours, but that is not going to be quality colostrum that we want them to get. So let's really work hard to make sure that they are on the bitch and getting colostrum during that time. Um, and if they aren't, then um, as Mindy stated earlier, um, 
they had, uh, say, a bitch that basically died. It's really important um, to harvest some colostrum from her um, and freeze that because we can freeze colostrum for years and uh, use that later on in life. Um, and that is critical because if they start getting colostrum at 8, 10, we are not going to get the benefit of, of the colostrum that we would get at four hours of age. I don't know why it goes backwards. I truly don't. So, so we want to detect low birth weight. That's one of the parameters that we certainly want to do. And again, we're going backwards, even though I am going forward. So the second thing um, we want to consider is the big three. And the big three is hypothermia, um, dehydration, and hypoglycemia. Because when we start talking about how we lose neonates, these are the big three. Um, and if we catch it early, then we certainly can do something about it. <laughs> so hypothermia is going to be the first one that we talk about. And so I actually have one, um, I guess, something we can answer on the chat. And I would like everybody to choose the correct neonatal temperature um, in our neonates. So there's our choices. And for those of you who can't see it, the first one is 101 and a half degrees. The second one's 97. Um, the third one's 95 and a half. And then fourth is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so just answer in the chat. Um, and Mindy or Deb can basically give me your answers and then we'll go on from there. Well, we've got a few answers so far. Anybody else want to chime in before I tell Dr. Kessler what y'all have written? Everybody That's seems in agreement. <laughs> uh, looks like everybody's in agreement with number two, 97 degrees. Wow. So, Mindy, our last, uh, and I, I can't remember the breed, our last as the vet chose 101 and a half. So, the beagles are way on it. So, 97 degrees is actually the answer. Um, so, congratulations to you all, because uh, in my world, that is not the answer I get very often. And so, basically, what it tells us is that our neonates. Um, cannot mo or, uh, control their own temperature. And the reason being is they have no shivering um, process. They, they have no fat on their bodies. Um, and basically they have no ability to um, monitor their, their own temperature and raise it or lower it like say our puppies in a couple of weeks will be able to do. One of the reasons that they uh, die from herpes virus is because they can't do that. If they were uh, able to basically run a fever, um, which they can't, then they would basically survive herpes virus during this time, but they can't. So they stay around 97 and a degrees, 98 at most. Um, but this third um, 95 and a half is really important because once they drop down to 95 and a half, and so that's only a degree and a half from 97, then they start to become critical. So the first thing I would like everybody to have as breeders is a thermometer. Um, and we don't want a, a thermometer that basically you, you measure the ears or the skin temperature. We want the old type pediatric thermometer where you um, stick it into their rear. That's a good way of putting it. Um, and the reason being is that they're most accurate at this age. Um, and if they get down into the 96, 95 and a half, then we have to take measures to correct that. And the first thing that we're going to do um, is basically try to raise that temperature slowly. So this is where um, I believe that every breeder should have an incubator um, and place that puppy into the incubator to get that temperature up. So that's the answer there. That's a thermometer, as you all know. And now we're going backwards again and again. All right, we're gonna do this, I know it. So dehydration, um, the majority of neonates um, not only die from hypothermia, but the next thing that comes is dehydration because once they start dropping below that 95 and a half temperature, um, they also lose their suckling reflex. Um, and, and basically, 
I told you earlier that neonates are basically a bag of fluid. Um, they're 82% fluid and, and um, th there's a fine line between being hydrated and dehydrated. Um, and it is very difficult for you all to be able to tell if your puppies are dehydrated. So I will tell you this, if, if they miss one or two sucklings, then they are dehydrated. Um, and you can't use the pinch of the skin like you can in a puppy or an adult, um, again, because they have no fat. It's very difficult to look at their gums and see if, if they're clammy. Um, so there really um, is only one good way to tell if our, our puppies or neonates are dehydrated, and that's by basically looking at their urine. Um, typical urine on a neonate looks like water, just like water. Um, and the reason being that's different, say, than an older uh, puppy is basically, they, I told you, their kidneys are not functioning properly, so they can't concentrate urine. But if that urine starts to look concentrated, uh, in other words, yellowish, then these are dehydrated. And we have to take immediate action to turn that um, hydration uh, around. So I will make a statement here. Your, your pup neonates can go 12 hours without nursing but they cannot go 12 hours without fluids. So this is the time to start thinking about replacing those fluids in, in our, pup, our neonates. And, and I, I give a talk and I'm gonna give a talk here in another month on um, diseases and, and puppies and neonates. And, and I always talk about dehydration um, in fluids. And while that is not a, a disease per se, um, in most cases, whether our neonates or our puppies are sick, they become dehydrated. So we want to make sure that every breeder has fluids around so we can um, rehydrate these puppies um, and do it correctly so we can get them turned around. So we have an incubator that we want to get up around 97 degrees. Um, we have fluids that we warm up to 97 degrees and we basically give uh fluids to them on an hourly basis until they're back on the, um, back at nursing. And that's how we do it. So we talked about 82% water for our neonates. But what, what we really don't know is that that milk that we're giving them at this time is also 82% water. So it's really neat how that works out. Um, and now we're on to hypoglycemia. So if we're going to save our puppies, we're going to get that, that temperature up to 97. Um, we're going to get them rehydrated. But we also have to start thinking that just about every sick neonate, um, I shouldn't even say just about, every, every sick neonate is hypoglycemic um, because they don't have the ability to produce sugar as an older puppy would. Um, they don't have fat stores, their liver isn't working properly. So we basically, if we're going to give them fluids, then we're also basically want to supplement them with some type of uh, sugar. So in my world, I like breeders to use lactator ringers with dextrose, um, because basically, if you look at lactated ringers, lactate is an energy source, um, similar to lactose and, and milk. Um, and the dextrose is basically going to replace the blood sugar there. And that basically goes all the way through puppyhood. If I have a puppy that's six weeks of age or seven that is, has a vaccine reaction, <coughs> excuse me, that has a vaccine reaction or just not feeling well, um, I'm going to reach for fluids before I reached anything else. I think in the breeder world, or I know in the breeder world that we too often reach for antibiotics when we really should be reaching for fluids. So um, most of us aren't going to be measuring blood sugars in our neonates, but if they fall below 90, then their risk of dying is four times that. So again, let's always be thinking of fluids and, and some type of sugar source so we can try to save these neonates. Um, the other thing that I would talk about that's not on here is that our neonates, um, if, if your puppies, um, if, if they're stressed, their heart rate goes up. And if their heart rate goes up, they are trying to get more oxygen. That is not available to neonates. Basically, um, it's the exact opposite. When, when neonates become sick or stressed, 
their heart rate actually goes down and their oxygen levels go down. So again, another reason um, to be able to pick up on neonatal uh, diseases early um, and also basically to have um, a incubator because if we give them during this time, uh, put them in an incubator with oxygen, then we can turn that right around. So the other thing, the last thing I would say about uh, saving neonates is um, antibiotics. And I said too often we reach for um, antibiotics as the first course. And antibiotics play a role in saving neonates. So you go along with raising their temperature, you go along with giving them fluids with dextrose you get, and give them oxygen. Um, then the next thing we wanna think about if they've been off um, food for a little while is basically uh, an antibiotic. And the reason that is, is because they have very little um, uh, bacteria in their gut. What, what bacteria they have is gotten from the bitch. Um, they are born sterile in the gut, but they pick up bacteria really quickly. Um, and so this is a time not to stick your fingers in their mouth um, because basically we don't want to introduce bacteria from us into them um, because they really have no immune system to fight that. But the antibiotics that we are going to use during this time, because once they start to reproduce in a stressful, stressed out neonate, um, is it doesn't take long for them to overtake that neonate. Um, you've probably all seen puppies that have what we call blue belly or purple belly or green belly. That just means they're septic. Um, and so we want to turn, um, turn that around with antibiotics. And the antibiotics that I recommend um, are cefazolin um, and Naxel. Um, I don't want to use any other antibiotics during this time because um, if you remember what I said, their, their liver and their kidneys aren't functioning properly, so they aren't able to break down antibiotics the way that, say, an older puppy would do. Um, and those antibiotics that I just mentioned are um, able to get through and do the job without overtaxing the liver and the kidney. And then the last thing that I really want to um, get on is the damage and, and I put on here damage, wet damage, and obviously you're looking at a roundworm. Um, all your puppies are born with roundworms and um, they cause a lot of damage. It's really frustrating that these go backwards. <laughs> okay, we'll get there. So the parasites that they're born with, all right making me grumpy. I see you laughing, Mindy. You can just stop that. All right, this is it. I got there. Um, so this is the damage that basically the parasites do in, in our neonates and our puppies. And basically this is the intestines. Um, you can see the parasites there. They're not an overload of parasites there, but um, what you may or may not be seeing is that those intestines are inflamed, they're thickened, they're red. Um, and what that does is basically um, allow loss of life in our neonates. And so um, you may be doing fecals on your bitch and not finding anything, and that wouldn't be unusual. But know that basically on around day 39, that hormones cause these parasites to come out of the cyst that are in the bitch's muscle and they start migrating either to the uterus or in the milk. And by two weeks of age, they're in our puppies already um, and they're into the liver. And once they're in the liver, they start migrating through up into the lungs and then they're coughed up and then they get back into the intestinal tract. So I talked to a lot of pathologists um, and these parasites are often missed. So if you send in a neonate that you lost, um, into a lab, a lot of pathologists are going to overlook the fact that these parasites are actually migrating. You know, they're looking at the intestinal tract, but they're not looking at the damage that could be done in the lungs or the liver. So never overlook the fact that um, you need a good worming protocol for, for our puppies um, and never overlook the fact that these parasites are coming from the bitch. So um, when we have a worming protocol for our puppies, we want a worming protocol for the bitch. 
Um, my, my rule of thumb is that no matter what puppies get, they're coming usually from the bitch. So um, the rule of thumb for uh, a worming protocol in, in our bitch and in our neonates is two, four, six, and eight. Um, and if you keep them longer than that, then 10 and 12, we want to be deworming. Um, and we want to deworm her at the same time. So that's actually what I have. Um, so Great. we, we can... got some stuff in the chat for you already, Dr. Kessler. Already? And, and, and I don't have to tell people how old you are if you say that you fed dogs in the 50s. I'm not going to go there. But anyway, <laughs> um, I'm going to go. I say from... 50s? <laughs> I'm in 80s. <laughs> what now? Never mind. Okay. I'm going to turn off the screen sharing so that we can see people. Oops. So it looks like I'm going to start from the, the most recent and go backwards, but um, we had a couple of questions while you were talking about uh, giving fluids um, and they may be similar. So I'll read them both to you and then you can answer them. Uh, one says, are you talking about giving sub Q fluids? And the other one said frequency and amount of D5LR recommended question mark followed up that says sub Q. Okay, so again, we're talking um, about neonates, um, not, not older puppies. Um, and so basically, no, I don't recommend in giving fluids uh, sub Q to neonates. And the reason being is um, they don't have any fat and blood vessels in that fat to absorb those fluids. So basically what usually happens is they'll absorb a little bit of those fluids, but basically those fluids set there. And so if we put a 97 degree um, fluids uh, into our, under the skin of our neonates, then um, they are gonna set there and then chill and then actually drive the temperature down, down in those neonates, which is actually something we want, don't want to do. So um, the way that I do it, um, for, and recommend for most breeders is not to give sub Q. If you're all pretty good at, at, um, tubing, you can give it by tube. And if you're not good at tubing or don't feel comfortable, then the way that I, I give it mostly, um, in my practice and also basically for the breeders that I deal with mostly is that we give it rectally. And the reason that we give it rectally um, is because as you probably all know, or, or if you think about it, you know that, that there is a, a, a great blood supply in the rectum and the large intestines. Um, and that blood can um, basically, we can absorb that fluid a lot quicker when there's blood supply there. Um, and so I, I give it um, rectally and been given it rectally for many years. I'm not going to say how many because many again will laugh at me. Um, but we, we give it rectally. And the important thing is to give it more often. So depending on how critical this neonate is, if they're not too critical and we caught everything early, then I might give it every hour. Um, and if I think they're critical, then I'll bump it up to every 15 minutes to a half an hour. And with your breed, I would probably give about a half a CC at a time. Um, and the reason, um, basically it's easy to do. You just basically, um, warm up that fluid. And again, I use lactated with dextrose, um, and we, we hold them with their head down and their rear ends up and we give some and we just hold them there for a few minutes. Now there's going to be some that come out. That's okay. But the majority of it will stay in there. Um, and when you go into the bag, the only thing I would recommend highly is that you take the needle off of the syringe when you're giving them fluids rectally, um, because that's not a good thing to keep that needle on. Um, so um, that's how I recommend giving fluids to neonates. And, um, it's, it's been a lifesaver for many neonates and, uh, it's an easy thing to do. So Dr. Kessler, early on, we had a question, um, please discuss herpes given the recent loss of beagle puppies due to herpes. So I don't know if you want more information on that, or if you oh, want to just okay. touch on the subject of herpes. No, I mean, herpes is obviously a virus and herpes occurs in um, just about every species of animals, but they're, they're unique, you know, so in human, humans, you know, we tend to get um, cold sores 
Um, in cats, they tend to get upper respiratory infection and eye problems. Um, and in dogs, basically, uh, especially in, in bitches that um, have not been exposed to before and have no immunity, if, if they pick up herpes virus during pregnancy um, and then they expose the neonates, then what happens is that those, those viruses get into neonates and again, um, they can't run a fever. Um, so the, they're easily overwhelmed with the herpes virus. Um, the only good thing about herpes virus, it's very easy to diagnose a neonatal death. Um, we just look at the, the kidneys and you can actually look at a speckled or what we call uh, petechial hemorrhages uh, on those kidneys. And, and that is basically um, pathognomonic for, for herpes virus. Um, and, you know, the, there are antiviral medications, um, but by the time that we even realize our neonates are, are sick, usually they, they are um, pretty critical and, and those um, antiviral medications aren't going to do much good. There are people that basically raise the temperature in the environment to 90, 95 degrees. I've actually known breeders that put them in the oven um, to try to save them that way. Um, and, and, you know, basically you, you know how rewarding that can be, um, not so much. Um, so basically the ideal is to have bitches that have been exposed. And, and if you know that your bitch who hasn't been exposed, has been exposed, then we certainly don't want to breed her. So if that didn't answer your question, then, you know, we can have follow-ups, Mindy. Okay. Well, the next question we have is what age do you recommend starting vaccines since the window of opportunity is stated to be six to 20 weeks? Okay. Um, again, that's a great question. And um, I don't have a single recommendation because um, for a couple of reasons, one is um, I would need to know um, the environment that these puppies are in. Have you done an excellent job of cleaning and disinfecting um, for parvo? Um, and you do that on a daily basis. And so you're using the correct disinfectant, you're using the correct um, cleaner, um, and you do an excellent job on that way. The second thing is, is that you're doing things that we, we, talked about on the first, I don't know, it was two or three slides to enhance um, the ability or, or basically to enhance the quality of colostrum, then if you're doing an excellent job on cleaning and disinfecting, and if you're doing an excellent job of enhancing that colostrum and you don't have a lot of dogs, then basically there's no reason why you can't wait till eight weeks of age. Um, now, if we're not doing such a good job or there's some lacks, say you know that a, a puppy did not get um, the colostrum, you just know that, um, then we are going to start thinking about vaccinating probably as early as three to four weeks of age. Um, puppies can um, react to a vaccine that early if they haven't gotten colostrum. So in my world, the majority of vaccines are, are given, the first one is between six and eight weeks of age. Um, and again, I go by um, the environment and I go by what I think they've done a good job on the colostrum or not. Um, and then also basically um, we, we talk about the most important thing is not to over vaccinate these puppies. The ideal time be, be between vaccines, no matter which one you're giving, is between three and four weeks of age. So there are breeders that like to over-vaccinate. In other words, they're giving it every week or every even two weeks. Um, two weeks is probably okay, um, but we certainly don't want to give it every week. Um, and so we, if we can, and, and you're doing an excellent job of disinfecting and cleaning, you know they got colostrum, um, they're not exposed to a lot of outdoor stress or other stress, um, then every three weeks is just fine between vaccines. And then we wanna go all the way out to that 20 week period and, and um, boostering those vaccines um, for parvo. You're not doing it for any other reason. Distemper, if you get one or two um, vaccines into them with distemper, they're covered. Um, in the same way with hepatitis, in the same way with 
uh, parainfluenza, but uh, parvo is a whole different uh, ball game. Um, and it takes that long to get close to 95% effectiveness on uh, against parvo, um, giving them that many vaccines. So since you're already talking about vaccines, our next question is, does the increase in maternal titer giving the parvo shot so close to breeding delay the coverage of the vaccines? Say that again, Mindy. Does the increase in maternal titer giving the parvo shot so close to breeding delay the coverage of the vaccines? I'll try to answer it. I'm not sure of the question, but let me. So I don't, if, if there's any time um, in, in a breeding dog's life that I don't go by titers is during pregnancy and lactation because pregnancy and lactation um, obviously are the most stressful times in that dog's life. Um, and so titers to me during that time um, doesn't really tell us anything. So lactation, let's just pick on lactation. Lactation, your, your bitches during lactation, it's like them running 25 miles a day. Um, that's how much energy they need. They're almost like an Iditarod dog. And so they're under a lot of stress. Um, and the titers during this time don't mean anything to me. Now, if you come back in six months or five months and say, you know, the, do the titers mean anything? Certainly. But when a, a bitch is under so much stress, then I don't go by titers. I just basically um, will vaccinate her that six weeks before um, because we're not just vaccinating her. She's not going to get parvo. But what she can do is, is um, shed parvo during that time because the majority of parvo that your puppies are going to get are environmental. In other words, it's not somebody brings parvo into your kennel or into your house or into wherever your bitch is. It's basically right there. Um, and so earlier on, I talked about proper cleaning and disinfecting um, because that's so critical because the um, if we don't do a good job of that, then basically parvo builds up in your environment. And just remember about 70% Bitches during lactation shed um, uh, parvo. Now, again, they don't have parvo disease. They build up immunity, and it is very uh, uncommon to find adult dogs um, that have parvo disease. So we're not worried about her. We're worried about those neonates and the puppies. And so if she's shedding parvo, which they will do because of all the stress they're under, then it's those puppies that we're concerned about um, and if, and again, it's more common for one or two puppies to get parvo than it is for a whole litter. That's not saying a whole litter can't get parvo, they can, but normally what happens is that one or two get it. And the reason one or two get it is that they've been either exposed to the majority of parvo that um, overwhelms them, or they're the ones that maybe didn't get the protection from the colostrum that they should have. Maybe they were too late to the teeth. Uh, maybe the teeth that they uh, um, were latched onto didn't have the quality of colostrum that the others did, which is not uncommon at all. Um, and so those two are the, the puppies that we are going to be concerned about. Um, and so to answer your question, no, I'm not gonna go by titers. I'm just going to vaccinate that bitch. Um, and make sure that I'm building up that immunoglobulin in her milk. Again, I'm not concerned about her. I'm concerned about those puppies. Hopefully that answers the question. Hopefully. Um, we're just going to take a couple more minutes. And since you just mentioned colostrum, the next question says, if there is a delay in giving colostrum, do you recommend giving commercially available colostrum? Um. So if, if you know they didn't get colostrum or there's a, you know, it's, it's 22 hours, um, then um, if you have access to K9 colostrum, then certainly go ahead and use that. And if you don't, I, I obviously, I, I still recommend giving bovine colostrum. And the reason being is, you know, and I'm sure you're all saying, well, they're not going to get parvo or distemper. No, they're not going to get to protection against that. But what they will get is growth factors, 
and they were all, also get antibacterial and antiviral factors that are in that bovine colostrum. Um, so I do recommend that. I do not recommend uh, and, and haven't for many, many, many years uh, giving um, serum um, or plasma from the bitch. Um, it just do the job that we want in, in our, our, uh, our, our bitch or, so, or our puppies. So basically bovine colostrum is my uh, second choice and obviously canine colostrum is our first choice. Okay. Um, what product or products do you recommend if the bitch is slow in producing milk for both the babies and for mom? Okay, so basically the first thing I do um, is think about pain. So um, I'm going to basically use a pain medication. I usually use Domperidone. Um, and the second thing I'm going to do is hot pack her teats. Um, short of that, there are other medications we can um, use. Um, basically, metoclopramide is one. Um, Domperidone is another one. Um, there is... Um, there's just all kinds of things on the market that will help drop her milk, but I usually go the pain route first um, and, and go that way um, and see if that works. And a lot of times that's all we really need to do because she's uncomfortable. And if she's uncomfortable, she's not going to let that milk down um, and she really doesn't want those puppies on her. So um, never overlook the fact that we can just basically take a, a warm or a hot towel and put her on the put them on her teats. And a lot of times that opens up those blood vessels to, to, to drop that milk. So um, I said, I think I said Domperidone, it's Buprenex that I use for pain medication. Um, and Domperidone I use to, to drop or um, to help that milk drop down. Um, this question I think came up a little earlier when you were talking about cleaning the environment, what disinfectant do you recommend? Okay. Good. Um, there are only uh, there are only a few products on the market that are actually good for for um, Parvo, and that's the only ones that I recommend because it's easy to disinfect um, distemper. It's easy to disinfect um, hepatitis or or kennel cough or parainfluenza. Very difficult to di to disinfect Parvo away. So the ones that I I recommend um, are Bleach, I'll still use 5% uh, bleach, um, half a cup per gallon. Um, if you do go that way, um, just know that we have to use a, a kennel degreaser, um, which are very safe for neonates. They're enzymatic. Um, and the one that I recommend is, is um, um, I'll think of it here in a minute. My, my old brain doesn't come back. Um, so basically an enzymatic degreaser, and then we have to use uh, a the bleach, which is, <coughs> excuse me, if we do that, it's about 100% effective against uh, Parvo. The other ones I use are um, Vercon S. Um, that's an excellent one against Parvo. Um, and you don't need to degrease every time you use that. There are the new products uh, out there. I haven't had much luck with the rescue products. Um, I know they, they claim that, but I just haven't had the luck that I would like with them. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to go against their, their research, but um, the, the Vercon S and the bleach I've had the most luck with. Um, and I know they are um, Parvo. The only thing I would say is you need to make them up the way the directions tell you to. And more bleach is not better. Actually, the half a cup per gallon um, is an excellent um, way to go. And, oh, I'll think, and I'll think of that de degreaser here in a minute. <laughs> so last question, Dr. Kessler, and I think we'll wrap it up. Um, we're going to go back to herpes for a second. If uh, Is there a way to vaccinate the bitch so she will have immunity before she's bred? How do you know if the bitch has or has had herpes? Well, the only way that you know if she's had or ha has or had um, basically herpes is do blood test. Um, now most cases of herpes in adult dogs is, is like a minor 
And when I mean minor, a minor upper respiratory infection. So that's very difficult. I mean, your bitch may be showing some watery discharge from her nose, but what dog doesn't have that? Um, there are vaccines, but they're not approved for use in the United States. They've got, they have to be gotten through um, somebody in Europe. Um, and, you know, you may have connections that way. They're not 100%, but they do a pretty good job of protecting her and also basically protecting those neonates. Well, I think that has uh, gotten us to the point where we are done with questions. So right. I just wanna thank you all on my behalf, um, as well as on Dr. Kester's behalf. I put my contact information in the chat. If any other questions uh, come up, please feel free to reach out and we'll get those answered for you. And I will turn it back over to Deb. Well, thank you again so much to, to Mindy for coordinating this. And, and obviously, thank you so much to Dr. Kessler. This has been fascinating. Um, I, yeah, I'm one of those people, we have a litter about every 15 years. So <laughs> it's like, okay. But for, for many of our folks, they're clearly having litters um, much more frequently. And so this is fabulous information. I private messaged Mindy and I, and I said, I think we need to do a part two, not until after the first of the year, we'll let everybody kind of do, um, you know, do their holiday things. But, you know, as I mentioned at the very start, I think this is something where um, we could really benefit from having these type of, of programs because anybody can participate at any time um, and from anywhere. So, you know, we will keep you posted on that. We do have another program scheduled um, in a couple of weeks where it's going to be uh, the, the panel of breeders um, that we did uh, have. Uh, John Woodring's not able to participate, but Darlene Stewart is going to participate. Um, so, you know, look for that information. Again, thank you so much to everyone for participating. You know, Mindy's information is in the chat. If you didn't get that, let me know. I'm, I'm more than happy to provide that to you. And if there's topics you want us to start covering, if this is something that we want to do, um, you know, let me know and, and we will arrange for speakers because I think this is a fabulous resource that, that we can do and, and provide to not only our members, but just anyone who is, is interested. Do we have anybody that has any final quick little comments? And you all are on mute. So if you, if you have a quick comment, you have to take yourself off mute. All right. Seeing none, I am going to go ahead and stop the recording. It's not going to drop everybody off right away. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.